All right, so welcome to Dermatology. It is week one. It is fall. It's 2020, and yes, COVID is still... Who would think it would have been around this long? Uh, but nevertheless, it's forcing us to do all our lectures online, uh, which some of you might like, some of you don't like. Uh, we'll be seeing... I won't be seeing you guys, but of course, we do have labs in person. So I'll be seeing my fifth quarter students at least. I'll probably run into some of you guys running around campus. So sorry I can't be there in person, but what are you going to do? All right, so here we go. This is our first lecture. And I built this class from scratch. Uh, when I got it, it was there were no PowerPoint slides. Everything was drawn on the board. <laughs> so how do you do dermatology with drawing on the board. I don't know. Got lots of pictures. The slides look like there's a zillion of them, which of course I give you a zillion slides anyway, but there's a lot of pictures in here, so we should be fine. And we'll, um, we will be meeting though. I do take attendance, so make sure you show up for uh, class because we, we have a class discussion before. Uh, you can read my uh, watch the videos before class and we can discuss them. I'll answer any questions you have, but I do take attendance. Uh, so this uh, this class is put together by a lot of great dermatology books, uh, Bologna, uh, Fitzpatrick. If I could pick one, I probably would go with Fitzpatrick. It's very well organized. Uh, there's a Habif clinical dermatology that's really good. The dermatology for chiropractors books, all due respect to the author, I just don't like it. It's, uh, no. Um, I do keep my eye on it, though. I have it, so I make sure that it, what I'm teaching you will be uh, taught in boards. And from what I understand, I'm pretty much spot on for boards with this material. There's a lot of dermatology, by the way, uh, especially Canadian boards from what I, my, my birds, my little birds have told me. Uh, if I could buy one set, it would be the, this Rook. Uh, it's about $600, so I think it's a little cost prohibitive. Um, so I did take s some information out of here. It's very well referenced, a great evidence, but it's just too expensive. We'll do a little histology that comes from June Kiera, which is the Board of Chiropractic Examiner Histology book. You had that with Dr. Doe. If medical people are watching this video, uh, Ross is the medical dermatology book that uh, will be on medical boards. Um, both of these are good. I like, I do like Ross better. If you read, put both of them together, you get a pretty good story. All right, let's start out uh, the skin. That's this kind of the star of the show here. It's also called the integument, the cutaneous membrane. It is the largest organ in the body. It's contained. Now, be careful here. What is the skin made of? Depends if you're a chiropractor or you're a medical student. Chiropractic students or medical students. Chiropractic students use Junquiera. And Junquiera says the skin is made up of the epidermis and dermis. If you use Ross, that says it's made up of the epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous tissue. So for us chiropractors, if a question asks, what are the layers of the skin? Subcutaneous tissue is not considered part of the skin. Uh, the epidermis, here's an embryology question. A uh, little weirdness here. The epidermis is derived from ectoderm in most regions of the body, but not all regions of the body. Uh, the dermis is made from mesoderm, really sclerotome is where it comes from. So it depends how deep the question is. You should know both of these. So that's a little weird. Dermis has two layers, a papillary layer and a reticular layer. That's where all the nerves and blood vessels are, right? In the dermis, the skin doesn't have any nerves or blood vessels. Uh, this third layer down, as I said, uh, it is not considered part of the skin as far as chiropractors are concerned. There are a whole bunch of AKAs for this subcutaneous layer. Uh, hypodermis, a really common one, one I had never heard until I uh, took this class, and a lot of authors use it, is subcutis, subcutis layer. Uh, Panoliculus, superficial fascia, which we talked about in gross anatomy, third layer down. Um, it is, what is it? It's a loose connective tissue layer right underneath the dermis. That's where all the fat is. It's bound very loosely. Remember, the epidermis and the dermis are bound together by hemidesmosomes, held together very tight. It's hard to get them apart. 
Uh, not so with the hypodermis and dermis. The hypodermis you can pull right off quite easily. There's no interdigitation system, no hemidesmosomes. Um, yeah, as I said, some authors include it as a third layer, but not Junkera. Let's take a look at it. So epidermis is this layer from here to here. Right, and the dermis is this layer in the red from here to here. It has a superficial layer called the papillary layer and then a reticular layer down in the middle. There are two general classes of skin, of course, you remember from histology days. Uh, there is the hirsute skin, like where there's hair, this is hirsute skin. No hair, glabrous skin. Uh, so those are the two types, glabrous skin thicker, right? It's got an extra layer that we'll talk about. Uh, stratum lucidium is actually only found in glabrous skin. So there's four layers in hair suit skin. There's five layers in glabrous skin. All right, hair suit skin. There's pretty hairy dude there, uh, but this is all hair suit skin. Uh, and it's also called thin skin, by far the most common skin of the body. Uh, it's we don't care how thick it is really. I'm not going to ask you that. Uh, uh, the glabber skin is the thick skin, contains no hair, palms, and soles. Has the stratum lucidum, one extra layer. Uh, it has sweat glands down in the dermis uh, that feed it. Though there's still the dermis is still normal, except it gets a little weird on the nails, which we'll talk about in time. All right, let's get into the epidermis. It's the outermost layer of skin. Completely avascular, there are no blood vessels in the epidermis. Uh, it has to receive its oxygen and nutrients via diffusion from below. The dermis below has quite a good blood supply. What's it made of? Stratified squamous epithelium, specifically. It's carotinized, so carotinized stratified squamous epithelium. And doesn't have six layers. That's should be four to five layers depending on where. Let's see if I can remember to change that this quarter. No number on the slide though. Um, yeah, that's what it's made of. It's anchored very firmly, as we said, to the dermis, specifically the papillary layer of the dermis below. Uh, there are these little finger-like projections called epidermal pegs that plug into the skin. Uh, and they plug into little sockets, as we'll see in the dermis. Uh, together, they make up the dermal epidermal interdigitations, and they're studded with hemidesmosomes, which bind them together very tightly. Here you can see these epidermal pegs. See those guys right there? And these are the dermal, and this is the epidermis here. Uh, specifically the, the stratum basale here, but epidermis has these pegs. They fit into these holes right here between the dermal papillae, and they're studded with hemidesmosomes. They're like riveted down. Right, Hemidesmosomes are really important. In fact, that's going to be our first disease process we're going to look at. Um, so there's the heavy desmosomes, kind of like a weird rivet, uh, only it's got a bunch of kind of rivet shafts to it. Uh, made of laminin-5. That's not super important for us. Uh, there's a plaque in a head, um, and we don't need to really worry about that. The only thing I want you to know is that this is the cell. Remember, all cells have a cytoskeleton, and this would be a, uh, a basal cell right here in the stratum basale. Uh, this would be the cytoplasm, this whole thing here, right? And this is the dermis down here. Uh, and so the the, skeleton, the cell, of course, has a cytoskeleton, right, to keep it together. Uh, the keratin filaments of the cytoskeleton actually collect or connect to the head of this kind of rivet, this hemidesmosome. They're welded to here together uh, by these proteins, and these are called BP230 proteins. I do want you to know that BP230 protein uh, is what holds the cytoskeleton to the hemidesmosome. And I know you're thinking, oh my God, Doc, come on. You're killing me with this stuff. Why is this important? Who thinks this is important? Maybe this little baby and her mom think this is important. Uh, because this little baby has a problem with this, these little BP230s. 
The problem is that they don't look right. The problem might be with the immune system. For whatever the reason, the immune system does not like the looks of these, and it attacks them, viciously attacks them. And it causes a inflammation here, and the cytoskeleton pulls apart. Hemidesmosome is broken, and you literally rip. There's a huge inflammation process that starts going on in here, uh, and you literally rip the skin or the epidermis apart from the dermis in this condition. And it is one of the most common blistering diseases there is. So let's talk about it. Uh, and this is called bullous pemphigoid, or BP, bullous pemphigoid. It is the most common autoimmune-related blistering disease of the skin. It's an autoimmune attack, as I just said, against BP-230. Uh, and uh, you can see my tremendous Photoshop skills here. Uh, there's a wicked inflammation and juice kind of exudate is, uh, and fluid, serous fluid is leaking out of this. I don't know about serous fluid, but juice and fluid is leaking here. Uh, and yeah, you get a, a rip between the epidermis and dermis because of this autoimmune attack. And it presents with these, these bullae. Uh, bullae are like blisters, but they're big blisters. These are not the like a friction blister or you know, some type of blister you get if you fall and, and had a friction injury on the floor. Um, so this is bullous pemphigoid, and it's, uh, the, it's rare, but it is the most common. If you're going to get a blistering disease, this is the one you're going to get. The other one that confuses students is one called PV, pemphigus vulgaris. I always think of a, a PV, a pole vaulter. A pole vaulter, you guys know what that is. You run down the runway with a pole, stick the pole in a little slot, and you try to jump over a bar with the pole, and the pole breaks, and they get some really nasty injuries. The same deal with PV here. Pemphigus vulgaris is much more deadly uh, than bolus pemphigoid. Watch out for the AKA for bolus pemphigoid. is just called pemphigoid sometimes, um, but it's not... BP or bullous pemphigoid is not as devastating. It's not as deadly. The mortality has been on the rise lately, though. They're not exactly sure what the story is with that. It usually affects either children or adults who are well-aged uh, uh, in their 80s. It usually hits. Uh, the presentation, it usually starts with common, it starts as a mysterious eudicaria, which happens to people. And sometimes my wife has had eudicaria attacks maybe one a year her whole life and there's no trigger she's been to stanford she's been everywhere you can't can't figure out what it is the dermatologist says we don't know it we see this all the time sometimes it just happens and that's how it presents uh, however pretty soon these start cracking open uh, and bleeding uh, and then you know it's not run-of-the-mill allergic hives you're not allergic to something this is an autoimmune type attack so the average time for diagnosis is about 12 months uh, so there's a pretty long period before you make the diagnosis. Um, it likes the arms, the groin, the flexor surfaces. Uh, Hansen's and Nikolsky sign are positive. I don't think you guys usually know what that means. Uh, so let's go over the Hansen sign. Sometimes it's called the Bulla spread sign or, or the Aspos Hansen sign. Um, and what you do if you have a blister, here's your skin. Let's say here's one of those bullae or blisters, you don't know what it is. If you take your thumb and push straight down on it and hold it uh, and watch what happens, that's a Hansen's test. If by pushing down on this thing, if the bullae actually grows in size before your eyes, that's a positive Hansen sign. You're actually ripping the hemidesmosomes apart uh, and making more room for the the uh, kind of effusion type thing, or the edema, I guess it would be an edema, it's not a joint, uh, uh, to grow. So that's called a Hansen sign. Press firm pressure on the blister. If the fluid doesn't move, um, then that's a good sign. Then it's probably not pemphigus vulgaris, it's probably bullous pemphigoid. So bullous pemphigoid, negative Hansen sign, negative Nikolsky sign. Nikolsky sign is the same thing. Here's the skin. Here's a bulla. So this time you take your thumb. There's my thumb. <laughs> and you start rubbing it back and forth. Do like a little friction burn. Don't touch 
don't touch the blister or the bullet though, right next to it. And Nikolsky sign, by rubbing here, in some people, you will actually spread the blister into the area that you rubbed. It's not good. That's probably pemphigus, that's probably, uh, pemphigus vulgaris. In bolus pemphigoid, uh, nothing will happen. So in bolus pemphigoid, they'll have a negative Hansen sign and a negative Nikolsky sign. Got it? So everything I just said, positive Hansen sign and Nikolsky sign is seen in Pemphigus vulgaris. Uh, a negative Hansen sign and Nikolsky sign is seen in Bullis pemphigoid. Now I took out the slides because Pemphigus vulgaris is quite rare. So I actually took those slides out, but it is up on my YouTube channel uh, and you should try to watch it. Um, I don't have enough time for dermatology. Uh, it's one of those areas where it's pretty heavily hit on boards, yet we don't we don't, you only have really technically 45 minutes of me. Um, I have enough. I've already put in a proposal to grow this class, but it's certainly not going to happen this quarter. I have enough slides for two of these classes easily because uh, there are a lot of dermatological conditions. Uh, some fun facts about bullous pemphigoid. Uh, it, you can order an immunofluorescence test to help make the diagnosis. Uh, in children, if it shows up in children, uh, it's usually not great. It might go away, but it could come back again the next year. Uh, it could hit and come back and hit and come back, so not a great thing. Uh, the treatment is run-of-the-mill. I'll say this probably a zillion times this quarter. Treatment for a lot of these dermatological conditions is just good old uh, corticosteroids like prednisone, systemic, oral. Um, you could probably start out by rubbing some stuff on there, uh, but that's not going to be strong enough. Uh, you should use Daprosone, which is a powerful antibiotic to go with that, uh, that prednisone. Layers of the epidermis, so that's we're out of that rabbit hole. Uh, so you should know all this stuff. The top layer is the stratum corneum or the horny layer. Uh, the cells are basically dead. They're flat bags of keratin uh, with flagrin and some lipid kind of waxy material around them so it's waterproof and the the cells are called corneocytes or aka squames squames is an important aka there um, and they're dead all the organelles are gone there's no mitochondria there's no ribosomes they're just basically a dead bag of really tough strong protein um, they still have tight junctions however but eventually even those go and once the tight junctions go they can flake off and float around and they make dust the dust around your apartments uh, is mostly from these microscopic particles of dead squames uh, there are stratum lucidum is the next layer down we already said that layer is seen only in glabrous skin and it's still dead uh, it's all the organs are dead in there. It, they're still flat cells, uh, but the bundles of keratin haven't clumped together as much yet. They're still in the clumping process. So therefore, it's practically a see-through layer. That's about all we need to uh, say for that one. Next layer down, which everybody has, the palms and hair suit skin, uh, this is the stratum granulosum. It's made of granular cells. Uh, these cells are starting to die. This is where they start to die. Uh, they have filagrin. Uh, has become quite prevalent here. Uh, it binds keratin filaments together. So filagrin is kind of like a glue uh, that makes keratin or that makes keratin strands clump together. And the more they clump together, the more the tougher the cell becomes. Granulosum continued. Um, so it also contains really important lam uh, lamellar granules. Uh, these guys are really important because they contain a little fatty uh, lipid-like material, almost a waxy-like material that is spit out around each carotenocyte. Uh, and it makes it waterproof. Uh, so the, the gene that makes these laminar granules is very important. 
uh, super important for skin barrier. You start to, this gene starts to peter out when people get older. And so they start to lose that waterproofing uh, ability of their skin. Their skin starts to dry out as well. Uh, but this waterproofing, this lipid layer, is really important for the skin's barrier function. Barrier function. What's that mean? Well, you got, you got SARS-CoV-2 all on your skin, let's say. How come it doesn't get into your bloodstream through your skin? Mainly because of this lipid layer. Uh, and because it can't go right through cells, but it can't get between the cracks of cells either because of this lipid. Uh, it's like uh, if you're putting up tile and you put in like a grout, that little white stuff that, around the tile in your bathroom that waterproofs it. Kind of the same deal there. Very important. And you have tight junctions as well. So here are some strands of keratin, uh, and they're starting to clump together because of the this flagrant here. Uh, and the laminar granules have already spit out a sheet of lipid material uh, that will eventually uh, go and surround the entire cell. This is, you know, the cell would be like huge, right? So it's got like a lipid layer, layer around it. Okay, now we're down to the prickle layer or the stratum spinosum. Um, this is normally the thickest layer. A lot of confusion here regarding this word, stratum germinativum. Um, so what is the deal with that? That always confused me, and it took me quite a while to figure this out. Uh, but by reading Ross and Rubens and some of the other books, I do have it figured out. So your chiropractic board book, uh, Junkera, uh, he says that occasionally the stratum spinosum layer will have some basal cells, which are stem cells. That, that's where all the carotenocytes come from. It'll have these basal cells in it. If it does, it's called another, a new layer called the stratum germinativum. So, Juncara seems to say that there's a stratum basale. Sometimes there's a stratum germinativum, and then there's the stratum granulosum above that. Uh, Ross, the medical book, says no, and a lot of other books, most of the other authors agree with Ross. It's just an AKA for, for the stratum basale, nothing more. Because germinate, germinativa means germinate, and where the, I mean, we're not flowers or anything, we're not germinating, but in a way, the stratum, the basal cells divide through mitosis. It's kind of like germination, so it's an AKA, and that makes a lot more sense to me. But nevertheless, for chiropractors, that's the official uh, definition. It's a kind of a modified st a stratum spinosum layer that sits in between stratum spinosum and stratum basale. Got it? Stratum basale is the deepest layer. It has the basal cells. Oh, where's all the slide numbers on this? I got them. That's kind of messed up, isn't it? Um, deepest layer. It's a single layer uh, of the cells are called basal cells. They are stem cells. They have the ability and they do divide via mitosis. And they actually, all these cells, the carotenocytes are all created all the carotenocytes, all those layers I just talked about, each has its own cell. Those all cells were once basal cells, and they split in half, and they, bec they became a, a prickle cell. And as they mature and go up, they morph into a different type of cell. Uh, but the, stratum, the basal cells of the stratum basale, um, that is where everything comes from. It also gives rise to the hemidesmosomes and the desmosomes. So it's an important little stem cell. So here's where we were. There's the stratum corneum, these flat ones. We can tell this is globerous skin because there's the stratum lucidium right there. Uh, there is the stratum granulosum, stratum spinosum, uh, and there is our single layer down here. That is the stratum basale, and there is the dermis underneath. Okay, the intermediate, filia, uh, intermediate filaments versus tonal filaments. So a, as we said, as the carotenocytes mature and they move up, they get filled with more and more intermediate fiber, intermediate filaments. And that intermediate, those strands are joined together by more and more filaggrin molecules. Um, so we get now bundles of intermediate filaments. Uh, and when you get bundles of intermediate filaments, uh, they get a new name and they're called cytokeratins or tonal filaments. 
So both either of these names, all that is is a whole bunch of intermediate filaments glued together uh, by filaggrin. Good. Uh, meet the cells. Uh, so we do have some other cells. The most common cell we just talked about in different stages are all the carotinocytes. Uh, and the, corne the corneal sites, the granule sites, and the, uh, the spiny cells, um, those were all once just carotinocytes. Right? There are other cells, though. There are melanocytes we're going to talk about because melanocytes, you get a mutation in there, and they can morph into malignant melanoma. Uh, so those are important. Those are those cute little octopus cells that inject melanin uh, into the neighboring carotinocytes and give them pigment. Uh, they give us color. There's Langerham cells or immune cells. We won't talk about those. Merkel cells are touch. I talked about those somewhere. I can't remember where I did. I think back in uh, embryology, I'm talking about those more now. Uh, but those are touch receptors. All right, let's look at the melanocyte real quickly. All right, so there it is, a cute little octopus in the stratum basale. Uh, it lives, this is the stratum basale right here, kind of lives in between the stratum basale and the, uh, the upper part uh, of the dermis. And it has little tentacles and it injects melanin into these cells. The melanin then goes and forms a nuclear cap, forms a cap over the nucleus. And this is uh, very good at, at absorbing UV radiation. Um, the b greatest irony, why the committee did this, didn't do this, I don't know, but one of the greatest ironies is this octopus unselfishly protects all these carotinocytes uh, from becoming mutated by UV radiation. But he does, he forgets to protect himself. So he, or it could be a she, I don't know what it is. We could call it an it. Uh, but he's vulnerable or she's vulnerable. It's vulnerable it, to UV radiation. So even though he's saving all these cells, uh, he's, he or she, it is not, uh, it is susceptible to cancer, right? UV radiation causes mutations in the genes, and when you replicate, you get monsters uh, that grow, and, and apoptosis gets turned off, and that's malignant melanoma. So why the committee didn't do that, I don't know. There must be a reason, though. Burn this picture into your brains. There's one thing I want you to remember from this class. Well, maybe two things. Uh, this is one of them. If you ever see a lesion like this that's bigger than a pencil eraser, six millimeters, there's a pencil eraser. You see something like this that's variegated. It's got dark brown, light brown, super light brown, it, even white in the middle of it. No good. This is malignant melanoma. This is superficial spreading malignant melanoma. Um, so very, very deadly type of cancer uh, kills by far more people. Uh, it, this is the number one killer. If you get skin cancer, you get this one. If you're going to die of skin cancer, this is the one that's going to kill you. There are other cancers are not, I don't want to say they're not bad. Some of them are incredibly destructive, but this one is very dangerous. What about this one? Well, you will learn they look scary, right? It's about the size of a pencil eraser, though. So, uh, but these little white bubbles here kind of give it away. That is called the, this is the great imitator. This is called seborrheic keratosis, and it can be really tricky. I can show you one, right? Well, I can't zoom in, though, but see these? I just got back from Stanford Dermatology. Even though I teach this class, you still got to check them out. Um, and yep, seber, classic seborrheic keratosis. These are easy ones, so they're not variegated, but they're crusty looking. We'll, we'll talk a lot about seborrheic keratosis. Carotinocytes, 95% of the cells in the epidermis are carotinocytes. Um, they have different subdivisions depending on how long they've been alive. The longer they're alive, they get pushed up and up and up and up until they fall off. So all those, the horny cells, uh, the granular cells, the corny cells, horny cells, those are all carotinocytes, def just different stages of their life created by basal cells, um, everything we said. 
a classic. Here's a basal cell in the stratum basale, and it's splitting by mitosis. In fact, we know it takes about 25 to 30 days for a cell to mature and fall off. And we're going to talk about something that greatly speeds that cycle up, but normally that's the speed at which these guys split by, my, by mitosis. It recreates a basal cell, and it gives rise to a, uh, it would be pushed into the spi a spiny cell, stratum spinosum. Uh, and then as another one is born, another one is born, they get pushed this direction. The whole process takes 25 to 30 days or so. Okay, so that's called, diff as they go up, they mature and flatten out and get filled with protein. And that process is called cell differentiation. Okay, we kind of looked at this before, but there's the different stages. There's a basal cell that's split. So this used to be a basal cell not too long ago, but now it's in the stratum spinosum. It's a spiny cell or a prickle cell. Right? And then another one is born, and this one gets pushed up to here. Then this guy splits again, and this guy's starting to flatten out now, and now you're up in the stratum granulosum. See how that works? They get conveyor belted straight up. And on their journey, they get flatter, we said. They get filled with more keratin filaments. Uh, there's more filaggrin to glue them together. Lami lami oh, I can never say that word. Uh, laminar. Lamer, lamular granules uh, start becoming more and more prevalent. Remember, that's the one who makes the, the kind of wax that's so important for these things. Uh, the lipid layer that, that surrounds these, that waterproofs them. Uh, and yeah, the organelles start to die the higher you go up. Um, oh, I was wrong. It was 23 days, according to June Kira. Some books say 25, some at the most 25 to 30 days is what's in my head. But about 30 day, 30, 23 days for you guys. Just, of course, there's no star. I guess I can put a star here. About 23 days, that that cell will slough off and become dust, and then you're supposed to dust to pick up that dust. A lot of that, those cells fall off at night, right? And they go right through your sheets, and they go into your mattress. And that brings up a new subject, dust mites. There's the electron microscopic view of a dust mite. Most people, no big deal. They don't bother people, and they can crawl onto your skin. I know that's kind of gross. Uh, some people who have unexplained eczematous rashes, uh, they test and they test and they test. Now they commonly test for different types of dust mites, and you can become allergic. Some people are allergic to these, and that rash is from dust mites kind of crawling around on them. Um, so that's... Uh, it crawls up in your nose and can give you a runny, constantly runny nose. I know it sounds gross. Most people, no big deal. But some people, this is the problem. They have to get hypoallergenic mattresses to fend off these things. Turnover rate is, oh, there's the range is even bigger. It's 20, 15 to 30 days, depending on uh, just your metabolism, I guess. 23 days, I guess, is what we're going with. And I don't guess we are going with it. It's there it is with a star. Some diseases dramatically increase this up to how about like every five days. Some diseases really irritate the stratum basale and it makes the uh, mitosis happen very, very, very quickly. And that brings us to a very common, I know several students have had this, uh, psoriasis, really common problem. And the turnover rate is, I want to say, 23, 24 times that of normal. We've got a slide coming on that. It's thought to be an autoimmune disease. They're still not 100% sure on the details of this yet. Uh, it is can go into remission. It can relapse. There's two types of it we'll look at. Um, this guy has classic chronic plaque psoriasis is by far the most common type of it, but we'll look at some of these. I know a student with a rare type. I know a student who had uh, the rare one. We'll look at in a minute. Some general stuff. The prevalence is about, it's not like Marfan syndrome. It's not like 0.05% or 0.01% of the population. Uh, it's 2% of the population. And the peak age, the peak prevalence, or the onset, the incidence, 
when does it show up? When did students first, their people, start first getting this? It's a double peak around some of your age. Well, some of you are probably a little older than this. But 22.5, if it's going to show up, that's one risk area. When you get about 55, another risk area for it to show up. Uh, the younger, the, the people who develop it in the 20s here, uh, they're in for usually a longer, well, obviously a longer course of this stuff, and it can get pretty bad. It tends to be the more severe cases that start early. Uh, if your mom or dad have it, if one parent have it, has it, you got an 8% chance of getting it. If both parents have the gene for it, you got about a 50-41% chance of having it. Certain ethnic groups, it's very rare in American Indians. It's a super, super rare condition. It is a lifelong disease. There's no cure for it because it's autoimmune. We can only treat the flare-ups and hope it doesn't come back. Uh, can be emotionally and physically disabling, incredibly itching. You can get infections because you're itching it. Uh, it usually in and of itself won't kill you, but it can just make it, it causes morbidity, not mortality, but morbidity. And that's kind of suckiness. Life sucks. A morbidity is life suckiness. I think I just invented that. Uh, anyway, uh, we've heard, I, they don't play this, but there used to be commercials that are programmed in all our older people's brains. The heartbreak of psoriasis, I remember the commercial well. Uh, and it's, it is heartbreaking. I mean, you get an attack of the stuff and you don't want to go out if it's on your face. I mean, this may be not too bad here, but this one, I mean, this is just, it, you know, I just feel so sorry for her. Uh, but that's classic psoriasis there. There's two major types of it. There is the eruptive type, eruptive psi uh, psoriasis. This is according to Fitzpatrick, who really lays this section out quite nicely. Uh, it's also called inflammatory psoriasis. Uh, this is a good one to have because it goes into spontaneous remission quite easily. It's not around. Uh, you get one of these outbreaks like this because uh, it kind of looks like this, real little uh, little lesions like this and it can disappear quite quickly and not come back for months to years the other one doesn't it's not like that at all so you usually get these multiple kind of salmon pinkish reddish erythema is the word for red so papules is a raised lesion doesn't have to be just a, any type of raised lesion that's less than one centimeter in size or 10 millimeters in size. So almost two, uh, the width of two pencil erasers. Those would uh, all be papules. And the key is to look for a silvery white scale on the top of it. That's the key uh, with psoriasis. They usually have a couple scales on them that gives them away. Here is classic eruptive psoriasis uh, on the buttocks here uh, of this uh, patient. And did I say it's rare? Yeah, about 2% of, if you're going to get psoriasis, only 2%. 2 out of 100 will have this eruptive type. I have seen it before with my own eyes. There's a close-up of the lesions. So they're slightly raised. Uh, they're probably about, uh, they look about the size of a pencil. They're probably about 6 millimeters. So anything under 10 millimeters or 1 centimeters in the raised, that's a, that is a papule. We'll go over. We'll start the language of dermatology the next, uh, the next video. And if you want to jump ahead, I mean, remember that quarter? Didn't I have you a couple quarters ago when all this craziness started? Put everything on YouTube. So dermatology is up on YouTube. Probably about ninety percent the same. Ninety-five. I'm constantly changing slides, so um, you could watch that if you wanted. But I would definitely watch these. Um, I should probably put these on YouTube, shouldn't I? Because the, I know the quality is just terrible on that virtual classroom. Um, so the other, the most common one is, is chronic plaque psoriasis, strong AKA chronic stable psoriasis, by far the most common. Uh, these are much bigger, same color, they're erythemic, maybe a little salmon erythemic plaques. So plaques, if you go over a raised lesion greater than one centimeter in size, is called a plaque. So you get these plaques, and they still have the silver to white scales on top of them. These guys are 
indolent. Do you know what that word means? They are chronic. They're indolent. That means they really don't change in size. If they change in size, it's super slow. Uh, but these can persist for many months, uh, even years before they go away. And they're they're pretty significant looking. Here's a, uh, here's a perfect example. 31-year-old female has had these large erythemic plaques with silver scales. See the silver scales on them uh, for the past eight months. Uh, this is classic chronic plaque psoriasis. Okay, that's all I'll say. I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole any more than that because we have a lot to cover. Uh, what are some factors that flare up psoriasis? Trauma. Probably the major, well, there's two uh, two really big ones. Well, these are all, these, these can all flare them up. Trauma is a really common one. You get a fall down, you get a rash or something if you're prone uh, to develop psoriasis. Uh, but w often what times you get a bug bite and you scratch the bug bite uh, and you get an outbreak of psoriasis from that. We'll talk a lot about itching and there's actually a LSC condition it's called uh, that is perpetuated. It's not psoriasis, but you can itching to break the itch uh, cycle, the scratch itch cycle. Scratching gives tremendous pleasure. It stimulates the release of dopamine like crazy. Uh, in, pe in some people. Uh, so it can be a real problem. Stress from, uh, from preparing for midterms, death of a loved one, any type of major stress, very high risk factor the development of psoriasis, even higher, maybe 60% in children. Uh, infections, especially streptococcal infection, uh, can, can kind of kick out a psoriasis to break out in the region. Uh, common medications too, uh, kind of surprisingly, glucocorticoids like prednisone is a treatment for a lot of dermatological conditions, but this is one where it, it can actually bring on psoriasis. So that's kind of weird. Lithium for uh, psychological problems, psychosis. Uh, and look at this one, beta blockers. It's probably the most common just well these are super common so these people with psoriasis have to be very careful of taking those medications uh what is the pathogenicity it's an out of control autoimmune attack on something in the dermis we don't like it's not bp230 we don't really know for sure cuz some people with psoriasis they don't you can't find any uh you can't find any any target for this stuff so it's it's a t cell driven attack that definitely starts in the dermis and bubbles up uh, into the epidermis. This, I can't go too far because there's not a lot of blood vessels there. Uh, but the cell cycle shortens by 28% or 28 times normal. So you're getting cell turnover four or five days, uh, and that's what produces those lesions. Uh, psoriatic arthritis, you will study probably this quarter, right? You have bone and joint, I think, this quarter. So you... If you haven't had it already, 17% of people with psoriasis develop psoriatic arthritis. That's pencil in a cup, right? That, that's one of the lesions. Very destructive type of arthritis. Uh, how do you treat it? Uh, so the tumor necrosis factor uh, inhibitor agents like a methyltrexate uh, is one of the big treatments for this thing. Uh, remember, you can't take prednisone or anything like that because that'll that'll perpetuate and bring out the lesion. Uh, but you can turn off the immune system with some of these uh, these super powerful kind of tumor necrosis factor alpha inhibitors. Heartbreak of psoriasis, yep, as we said, it's emotionally draining disease. It's not dangerous in and of itself usually. Uh, lesions begin as benign erythemic scales, papules, we already said this. Uh, they can be a little lichenified. We'll talk about that next week. We, I could really take that slide out. Chronic plaque psoriasis, right? There's a, a plaque, well-defined raised lesion, definitely bigger than uh, than 10, 10 millimeters. This one's really unusually silver. Uh, here's more commonly what they look like. There's one there as well. So chronic plaque psoriasis. These are all chronic plaque psoriasis. It's All right, we did it. There's our first 
uh, our first uh, lesson on dermatology. So uh, we will meet before class. Don't forget, I'm going to take attendance. Uh, the bright space will take attendance for me and ask questions. And we'll see you then.